bring. Pardon me for just one minute. Literally, I hope. Here at the beginning of the episode, just wanted to let you know as we are moving into the holiday season that uh, the Broken Brain is sponsored by Givaderm. Givaderm believes in high quality skincare products that are completely natural. They say if you wouldn't eat it, you shouldn't put it on your body. But guys, don't eat the products, but especially because they go so well on your skin. Go to www.giveaderm.com. Remember to use the purchase code BROKENBRAIN, all one word, at your checkout in order to get a 10% discount. You can also get a link that takes you right to the Broken Brain purchase option without entering the purchase code if you go to dwighthurst.com slash support and you'll find all sorts of ways to interact with the program there and uh that's one minute recording in progress officially underway for this latest episode of The Broken Brain. So grateful to everybody out there for listening and for joining. Um, I, we have a great, great show coming up today. It, that's how confident I am. It hasn't even happened yet. We haven't recorded it. We're, we're doing it now. And I know it's going to be awesome. I can already tell. I am grateful to have Nick Johnson on the show today. He is the author of Executive Loneliness, the Five Pathways to Overcoming Isolation, Stress, Anxiety, and Depression in the Modern Business World. And I get that. I try to get the subtitle in there with the title, Nick. Did that work out okay? Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. And it's great to be with you today, Dwight. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of really cool, uh, important things. They're not all cool to experience, but they're cool to know that are, that are inside of this. Uh, I was reading on your book and also just the things that you have to do about has really a lot to do with some of the elements in uh, the world, the modern world. Your focus, I know, is on business and things, but talking about uh, the ways that some mental health issues and depression and even so touching on uh, self-destructive coping skills and things and how that is even brought in. And, and we're going to get into all of that and how it's even in some ways, reinforced uh, by the modern world as well. And even in, in some of these unhealthy practices are even encouraged. So, But before we we dig into some of those topics, why don't you uh, introduce kind of yourself and tell everybody a little bit about you and, and uh, where you are coming from? Yeah, sure. So I was born in Sweden, educated in Australia, and then I lived and worked in Southeast Asia last 20 years, mainly in Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, where I've been working my way up the corporate ladder. Uh, and these days, though, I left, left the corporate world and I'm running a business where we organize co uh, corporate uh, and entrepreneurs together in confidential peer group meetings. And outside of work, I'm quite active in recovery myself, and I'm giving back now and supporting the, the recovery scene. I'm talking about 12-step programs, recovery, and so on. And I'm also an athlete. I'm top 1% in the world in the Ironman triathlon sport So uh, for my age group. So that's what's keeping me healthy, fit, happy, and busy. That's good. Yeah, I was, I was reading there about uh, your... Uh, accomplishments with uh, the bike bike events and also the Ironman. Uh, that's always one that uh, man, that's impressive to me. And I've I've gone through periods of uh, more or less activity where the height for me is running at all. That's me. That's my top. That's my top. Right. And so I've kn I've known people who have done some of those high powered events, and it's always very impressive to me knowing a little about how hard it is to, to be active and actually try to move my body quickly. So I'm always very impressed with that kind of thing. <laughs> so that that's, uh, uh, you, you talk a lot in your message, uh, maybe tell people a little bit how it formed, but you know, about that. The, one of the things I like, by the way, is just that I'm excited to have, have the conversation is you seem to have a very well-rounded approach, even just in your intro there of saying, having passion, having health, and then, of course, a time for recovery and mental health uh, as well. And so how did you get into the focus on this stuff? Yeah, so 
I guess society set us up for success. And, you know, at university, I was driven by trying to get scholarships, topping classes, you know, and sort of the dean of the business school was telling us, you know, number two is the first loser. That's how we look at sports. So why don't we all study harder and, and, and top the classes and so on? And that's the mentality that I had at university. And then I brought that with me into the workplace and perhaps elbowing my way up to the top, you know, pleasing the bosses, getting the bonuses promotions and everything that comes with it and people look up at you they share at you and perhaps taking a bit of distance because it can be a, a quite a lonely affair and as they say it's lonely at the top and that's where I found myself about seven eight years ago once I reached what society set me up to be uh, I reached those managing director positions in bigger companies international firms that comes with all the perks the packages and so on and then when I was there, that's when I started to question, you know, what is it all about? And I wasn't happy. I thought once I achieved what everyone has set us up to achieve, what everyone sort of admire, then I was starting to question everything about it. And with that came a, a big personal crisis for myself when I realized that I, I was a fraud. I spent all these years to chase this and then it wasn't what I wanted. Hmm. And that was the beginning of me questioning everything and what everything unfolded after that. Yeah. The the focus on uh, productivity, you could call it, or achievement. And that's it's very interesting to me because obviously being an athlete as well as uh, an entrepreneur and, uh, you know, running a business and just doing leadership, obviously you remain in a mode of achievement, like, like achieving things. But you talk a lot of what I've seen about the dangers of that of achievement being uh, hyper-focused. Yes, absolutely. And these days, though, I do it very, very differently than I used to do. It used to be all about me. And these days, it's all about also giving back and, and showing up in my best shape. So while I also did marathons and uh, Ironman triathlons, before when I, before I hit my rock bottom, which we will touch on today as well, in 2018, when I hit rock bottom, it's the before this, and it's after that, but that's when I live two completely different lives. So these days, basically, I'm using the sport to really be surrounding myself with people rather than doing it alone. I'm there to give back to the younger ones and being seen. And, and, and it's a different approach. Before, it was about me getting the medals. These days, if I can tick the box when you register for a race to save the environment also, uh, uh, to not get the medal, then I'm happy to tick that box. It's not about me. It's about being still healthy and happy, about being in a community and doing great things. It's interesting if you look at the idea that you mentioned that, you know, second place is the first loser or, you know, if you don't get the promotion, then you lose. I guess, I mean, that has to affect how you treat other people then too, right? Because if I view everyone else, if I have to be number one and number two or below are all losers, that means y'all have to be losers, whatever I got to do to not be the loser and and, what, and even make them the loser uh, in a way too. It, very, it, it can, it lends itself to a cutthroat kind of mentality that's not fair for anyone, actually, if you think about it that way. Yeah, absolutely. And it would be a lot of losers. And if you think of a class with 30, 40 students, that means there's only one in there. The rest are losers. And and and, and that was the analogy that basically the dean of the business schools was showing when I came to a private university in the late 90s then in Australia. And he showed it that if you look at sport, uh, and he was showing a video of a team, you know, playing football, and the winners obviously lifting the trophy, cheering, you know, spraying the champagne, being the heroes. And the losing team who just almost made it as well, walking off crying, you know, and looking with the head down, you know, and he said, why don't we apply this to business? Why don't we apply this to study? I, and he, he was doing it to fire everyone up to really try to chase it and that you would be fully rewarded, you know, if, if you are at the top because they wanted to compete with the international universities. And, and that becomes a game, right? And it, it fires up some people. And it spoke to me at the time, having left Europe, coming to Australia, and I saw it as a way to prove myself. And I can remember being incredibly proud when I topped some of those classes. You were invited for a nice champagne evening. I remember even flying my parents all the way from Sweden to Australia to attend one of these functions when I got that diploma, you know. And I remember, you know, really feeling uh, like I was put on a pedestal and, and you know, it spoke directly to my ego. And I wanted more of that. That becomes addictive as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it sounds like uh, it hits you either way. If you you get into that power, addictive, ego stroking kind of thing, well, it's almost like the alternate then is like if you're not number one, that's depressing. But you're also talking about the depressing nature of becoming number one as well. It's like a double whammy. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, one way of putting it is that, you know, and I've been questioning myself lately and, and or during the last couple of years and other people also, why is it that it's it really spoke to me, that message, and what drove me? Well, I am probably an anxious overachiever. And then I start to question, if I'm an anxious achiever, uh, overachiever, what about the other CEOs out there or the top leaders? And I found out and through the research of my book and interviewing uh, executives from my book, I realized that many, many of those holding the senior positions are in fact anxious overachievers because what happens then, it just fuels us, that insecurity fuels us to work so much harder and sacrifice so many other things. That means you put everything else second, family, relatives, everything else put second. And it's all about you achieving. You're putting in double hours to everyone else and you got to get the head. That's how I topped the, that was my secret at the university. I just worked much more than anyone else. Yeah. How much of that's related to the definition of success, of what, what we think we're supposed to be successful in? Yeah, exactly. And that, that's also something I question, you know, and, and, and what is really success? Is success uh, to be helping others, be there for others, and, uh, and you know, being jolly and free? Or is it to be standing there with a trophy and getting the awards and, and, and the scholarships? You know, it, it's basically, it, it can be turned into a bigger question to uh, really, really question the whole society, the way we are set up and raised. And, and, and that is the page I'm on at the moment. Mm-hmm. I heard... Uh, uh... Gabor Mate talking about this on a, a, a podcast I was producing. He was he was talking on that um, about uh, how we inadvertently program and are programmed by that. Like even with our kids, we say, "Hey, you you got the grade. I'm proud of you." Do we remember to say, "But I'm proud of you always," or "I accept you already," and this is a nice thing that happened to you? Or how do we do that? We start to pro- get programmed from an early age of, "I've earned love now." Right. This is how I earn approval or earn validation. And I, it's hard to get into, like, how do you avoid that? Like, you know, uh, we're, it's so ingrained. And you've been exposed to so many different cultures through your life. It sounds like you're seeing it, that it's pervasive through different, different cultures as well, that kind of expectation. Absolutely. And perhaps it's even stronger in Asia. And especially if we look at Singapore, uh, and uh, Singapore will always be, especially if you look at mathematics or, or, or all these international competitions, it will always be on top or up there. And, and, and you know, um, even though they have extremely long hours, even for young children uh, to study, the, the parents who can afford it will hire private tutors to teach them during the evening, during the weekends, to drive them so hard. Uh, because they want the children you know it's like an investment for them they have invested in this child and the child better be the best and go to the best university and perhaps it is because it's a young country it's also a small country that you can drive around with a car in a few hours Mm. that it's that mentality you know that you you got to really work so hard to make it so i've seen it at the at the very extreme in a country like singapore and it's much tougher and the parents are much harder on the children that they would be in the Western world. And uh, I now have a son who's 14 with my ex-wife. So I have also had a lot of reflections and, and I'm, I'm trying to be the complete opposite. And what you mentioned there, do you know, do we congratulate them and give them a reward when they have a good grade? But what happened to the term when they perhaps have had some personal crisis because they're teenagers? Don't we congratulate them on finishing the term? That's a question to ask. And I've been trying to, to be as neutral as I can. And I have actually... In all my conversations with my son, I said, go through it, have a good time, do your best. And, uh, and if anything, my message is, it's more important to show up for, for sport than for an exam. That's basically my <laughs> message to my son. Yeah. No, uh, I I wonder what drives us. Do you think there's something in humanity that, that drives us that way? Or have we just been, I don't know, everybody's gotten into it because... It, it It is something that seems to pop up. It's like, boy, if I did something... If the outcome was good, 
then I did good. If the outcome is not good, and that's even a subjective definition, I guess. I mean, if I got an A, I did good. If I got a, a B, I did bad or whatever. Um, yeah, mm. what what drives this? What, what creates this? Do you have any theories on that? Yeah, I think it's the fear of failure. I think it's also that anxious anxiety inside. And if you are a parent, you might be very worried that your child is going to drop out of school or they're going to fail the exams and they're not going to go. So I think it's the it's the anxiety that the parents have that they put on to a child. But that pressure from parents to a young child is too much for many. And that's why, sadly, you know, and I'm talking about this in my book as well, that's why some of them are giving up on life. And, 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 and that, again, we need to question that. Is it fair for parents uh, to, to put children in that position? And then while I managed to perhaps grind through uh, my childhood and my parents didn't put on that pressure, but I felt that pressure anyway from the society and from teachers and everyone else, uh, as you said, it might be that the, the teacher, you know, you know, is congratulating someone uh, who's topping the class and then the rest is just quiet. And and I was uh, just a very average or a bottom to medium uh, sort of performer in most years in my studies. But in Australia, when I heard that intro talk, I got fired up and I worked so hard to achieve it. And, I became, and as I said, it also becomes addictive once you get the taste of that kind of fame, then you want more of it. Yeah, wow. And so uh, talk a little bit, maybe uh, tell us about the cost of that mentality when you really get wrapped up into it. Well, the cost, as, a, uh, uh, as I said, it can be fatal, right? We, we, I have lost friends. I have lost people. And um, I, I, I wrote my book in 2019 in the memory of one of my friends who is not with us today. And um, we didn't know he was going through a difficult time, but that's the ultimate price. And, um, and, and, and do we want to do that as a leader? And it doesn't matter if we are a leader of a family to our children, or if we do it as a leader in a company to our employees. I worked in a company where a young operations manager ended his own life because he couldn't cope with the pressures of the boss. And imagine how you feel then as the leader, knowing that you were perhaps the cause of it. And, and that's why we, what, what we need to question ourselves uh, as leader in our society, because that's what we are doing to the people around us. Hmm. And it perpetuates itself with the success related. Uh, you talk about hiding behind achievement, I think was, I wrote that down as I really like that phrase, hiding behind achievement. You also use the phrase, uh, uh, smiling depression. I wonder if you could define that for people. Yes, and there's a lot of talks about people wearing masks. And, and, and we live in a society now where it's so easy to put on that fake mask. And what I mean with the term smiling depression is that that was the best term I could come up with to de describe what I was going through because I then lived in Asia, my parents and family in Europe, and they saw me perhaps once or twice a year in person the rest, they saw me on Facebook or other social media. And it's very easy to put on a smile on that picture and you post it, you know, and you just make a post once a month or twice a month when you're doing something meaningful. And then everyone will make an assumption. Oh, yeah, he's doing fine. Everything is good. He has a smile on there. But what I learned was that uh, when you are unwell internally, especially if you're going through emotional or mental issues, you actually learn to put on that fake smile the whole time because as soon as you see someone, you're so used to smiling because you're scared to be exposed. So you better put on that smile the whole time so that no one should question you. And that's what happened to me because no one knew that I was going through a difficult time in 2018. Not even my uh, uh, new wife who I got married with during that time. She was completely shocked when I sat her down to the sofa and explained how I felt internally. She had no idea and she was closest to me. And everyone said, you know, no, you're so jolly. You're having a great time. Well, that was what I'm calling the smiling depression. I learned to fake it. Yeah. When I worked uh, in, a, as I have worked in addiction treatment, the phrase pops up a lot of times where someone is a functional uh, functional. I don't always like the term addict uh, personally, but uh, a functional. They'd say a functional alcoholic, a functional addict. Uh, I would just say a, a, a 
you know, functional life despite this this secret dysfunctional thing. And one of the things about that term that is destructive, even that term can be destructive, where it's like, what is functioning? Am I functioning in the sense that I what we usually mean by that is I haven't lost my job. And sometimes that's the yeah. only definition. It's like I get a lost, you know, relationships or other things and friendships and all those things. But as long as it's not too public, right? As long as long as it's just like something I can sweep under, like that ah, normal kind of. Uh, but I, hey, I've held a job. I, I'm making a living. I don't have any criminal charges. And if that's the if that's the measure of happiness, right? That that that's mm. what's functional. It's not very functional if that's the only thing that I can hold up, or if that's the main thing. Absolutely. And if us as normal human beings can do that, hold up a job and then we, we are abusing some addiction or we are not well offline. And uh, the, the latest episode with Rich Roll was posted yesterday and he had uh, Chris Heron, the NBA player on the show. And he said he could go up in the court and deliver his best match ever. And then he could be as quick as he could in the dressing room to go home and go down in his basement and, and do some drugs. That was at the peak of his, of his career. And so you can imagine that he could actually put on the best show out there and then still behind the scene, right? So that's what we're talking about here. It's about covering up, call it the smiling depression or whatever we want to call it. But that's the double life that, you know, again, that perhaps society set us up for. We are running away from something. We do the job, we get the game done, but then, you know, we need something to cope, some way to cope. And we get into where then uh, addictive behaviors or unhealthy behaviors even become, they, they function like a solution, right? It's like, I need something to solve these problems. And I definitely can't do healthy things because boy, that's, that's too much vulnerability. Yeah, absolutely. We, we sort of hide behind it, right? And again, just to mention the example of Chris, he said he couldn't cry. He had so much pain inside him. He couldn't cry, but with the use of drugs, he could cry. So that became his sort of way to be able to live out the emotions that he could, he should have been able to deal with as a normal human being. And for me, um, I was too tense and I was, you know, it was too much going on in my life. And I used alcohol to slow down the thinking and I could function better. I could do my job calmly and nicely without making errors when I was drinking some, some alcohol. And I wasn't the kind of type who, who drank myself out of a home, I, but, I, but I was becoming a drinker, you know, Oh, I have some sales calls today and meetings, then I better have a couple of drinks because I know I'm going to do better. And then you feel, oh, yeah, that worked very well for me. And then before you know it, it becomes a bad habit. And before you know it about that, then the bad habit turns into an addiction. Yeah. No. And then people want you to stop. <laughs> if it does come up, right? People are like, hey, take this thing that's the thing that's getting you by and allowing you to function. And uh, we're not going to talk about what it is you're self-medicating. Let's just say, hey, stop it. If you just stop it and you're not drinking as much, or sometimes if I don't see you drink as much, I'm just going to assume it's better, right? It either gets driven underground or maybe I find some other way to self-medicate that's that's not healthy because we aren't addressing the core problem at that point. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and and then comes all kind of medications and things like that that you can get prescribed drugs drugs from doctors who do very much the same job but label them perfectly okay. So we, that's that's unfortunately the the downside of everything we're talking about here that we as human beings if if we don't talk about this and if we don't deal with it then we 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 seem like we need some kind of mechanism to just function as people in this society that we created for ourselves well back when you were still in that mentality like let's say i don't know you you lose a job or you don't get that promotion or things what what did that cause you to do it kept me very closed i didn't know how to share it with everyone I didn't know how to talk to anyone about it. I was full of shame and guilt. And I can remember being laid off from my first senior assignment. It was in 2007. I worked in Vietnam as a area sales manager for a cosmetic company. And I thought I was doing well, but I was suddenly let go. And it was a huge blow to my ego, the first big blow to my career. And um, I didn't want to tell anyone that I was let go. I was very secret. I, did, uh, I didn't tell my parents. I didn't tell my ex-wife. 
I was keep thinking about what I should say. And I remember that I started to talk about building a story that maybe I should work in something else and trying to paint the picture like I was preparing everyone that I was not happy with my job and that I would look for something else. And then eventually when I managed to secure another job, I say, yeah, yeah, I made a move, you know, so, so it was all lies. I wanted to cover up for it and make it sound like I'd made a jump to a better job. But internally, because I didn't talk to anyone or deal with it in the proper way, I kept it all inside. And then it was only a couple of years later when I was let go from another job, it was really coming all over me. And that time it was a merger and acquisition. And that time I completely became broken to the point where, again, I couldn't explain to anyone. Instead, I... I asked my ex-wife to move back to Sweden with our son. And I said, let me deal with this myself. I will find another job. So that was my mechanism then, just to close in completely, isolate myself. And perhaps as many times as a typical man, we say, well, I should sort out this myself. Yeah. So how long did that go when you weren't telling anyone? Did they anyone find out before you secured the next job? Or were you able no, to keep but, that that first time? No, so... Yeah, so uh, the, 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 no, I was able to keep that and uh, wow. no one really found out. It was only later on uh, when I wrote my book, all these stories came out when I started to work on myself. And 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 eventually, though, I, I managed to get uh, a, a new job, a great job. Uh, but I was so anxious at this point, being worried that I was going to lose this job too, that it uh, that uh, anxiety uh, it was too much for me. So despite doing really well in the job, I resigned from the job because I thought it's better I take shots of this. Uh, and then uh, that's when I, that led me to the complete fall after that. Well, if the only way to be acceptable is to win, uh, I can't accept myself if I don't, right? Exactly. Yeah. So if you're mediocre, that means you already lost. Or if you're in the middle where... Where I, I strive and love to be now. I just want to be in the middle. Hmm. Yeah. It also strikes me as very lonely, what you're describing, because the very people that we shut out are the same people who, hopefully, if they're in our intimate circle, would be the ones that, the ones that it would be a healthy experience for all of us to go through together, right? If it's like, I mean, you look at it like that. If my if my spouse or my child is going through a hard time, I'm going to pitch in and I'm going to say, let's pull together. Let's try this. Let's try that. And, you know, be, being lonely like that from uh, people, as I've seen this in myself, of like, oh, I don't want to admit failure. I don't want to reach out, right? And then you look back and say, wow, think what, it could have been like if we'd all pulled together, if I'd given other people that opportunity to be there for me, you know, they probably would have, or at least would have tried. Yeah. And, and actually I was given a mentor in, in my company and, and also my boss who hired me to the same company for a second time. She was great. We had wonderful conversations. I would come over to her house on the Sunday. We were jolly having great times together but when it was some issues in the work, like I can remember we were given a, a project which involved a lot of Microsoft Excel and I was not so comfortable with that. I didn't tell her because I didn't want to sh uh, say that I couldn't master this. The fact that I was excellent and very good in the, you know, uh, a part of the job which was most important was getting new contracts in the business development, the sales. Uh, I, but I could have raised a hand. I could have gone and told her, and by the way, I'm not so comfortable with that. Can I get some support? Is there some way? But I didn't do that. And, and that was my, my major issue. And to my mentor in the company, I also didn't share it. But again, these were all internal people. And normally we are quite scared to share internally. If the company would have given me an external coach who would have really spoken to me about my feelings and how I feel about everything, then this might have come up. And that's perhaps a message to anyone who's a leader, maybe in a family or in a business that consider, you know, for the people around us to allow them to have some someone who they can have neutral, confidential conversations with. Yeah, it's a great point. And think of the culture that we create in families or in businesses or in any group of people uh, in inside and then internally in our own selves, create this culture to where it's like, boy, I don't want to admit I'm having a hard time. And you think what that says about our coping skills, but also what it says about the cultures that that we all just know internally, I'm not supposed to, so I better not say it. 
instead of having an expectation that, well, people around me, they care, I should be able to. So yeah, there's this feedback that we get from that to be like, uh, and especially as you put it, that some of that fear and anxiety got confirmed at times, even if it wasn't logical, it gets confirmed when we have a bad experience. Well, I lost the job. Even if it wasn't my fault, I still am going to blame myself, <laughs> right? I still know that I failed, even if a company went out of business. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do it, you know? Hmm. Yeah, and, and I think one thing I want to add here as well, that during all these phases, I was surrounded by great friends uh, uh, through golf, through cycling, through swimming, or no matter what it was, I had fantastic friends. I would go and watch sport together, we'd do sport, and I would have the most amazing time together. But I wouldn't bother them about these issues. I didn't tell any one of them, oh, by the way, my boss gave me this project in Excel and I'm not so comfortable about it and it's keeping me awake all night. I didn't share that with anyone I because I felt that I was at fault. I thought I should have known better. What's wrong with me? And I didn't want to admit it to anyone. And something as small as that, when you walk around with that, you know, day and night, and when you're falling short and then mistakes are popping up and trying to cover it, it just snowballs into something that is so big um so again yeah i we i think we're not given the tools to to learn how to speak up and ask for help as well yeah i'm curious about the concept you just you mentioned a bit ago about shooting for the middle um tell me more about that is if we can thrive in the middle or what are we shooting for and and what is that like well it's it, if you ask people who are in recovery, and I, I'm, you know, I'm in recovery now. As I said, it was a 12-step program that helped me. And the the last step of any 12-step program is that you have to give give it back. You have to be there for others, and as they say, you have to give it back to keep it. So it's a daily thing where you have to give back. And one of the most common things you will hear when people are sharing inside these meetings and the meetings I've been to in the big cities and so on with. CEOs, business people who made it, you know, most of them, if not all of them, we said that they just want to be the average person, you know. They wouldn't want to have a car that stands out when you drive it on the road. They want a normal house. They want everything just normal, not to stand out because that did not do us any good, you know. And and, and it and it's really how I feel as well, you know. And 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 it's a different way of living when you just conquer to all, all those commercial perks. Uh, in the world, it's possible to live more jolly and free somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My brother has a, a administrative leadership position and has before in companies. He's a marketer, graphic artist. Uh, kind of, if you're listening out there, Christian, I hope I described your specialty well enough. He's in the business world. I, you know, I'm a human services person. I don't understand what business is. But anyway, <laughs> but you and he would get, no, you you guys get it. And, 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 but anyway, he has told me before that with uh, once he had a certain title, when he would go somewhere on assignment or a business trip or whatever, oftentimes the car rental places would say, hey, do you want to upgrade to this, the, the one Corvette we have on the lot or the one? And they would just assume, well, you must want to drive this around, right? Uh, and, you know, that was surprising because he didn't aspire to be like, look at me, I'm the big swinging you know, whatever <laughs> here. And, and so maybe lucky for him that he doesn't wired that way, but it's interesting that you say there's an, and if there's an assumption, that means that people are doing that. And it also reinforces it. If people are having that ego, it's, I'm going to feed your ego by giving you this fancy car to drive around this weekend or whatever. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, 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 and that is perhaps the most challenging part of recoveries to deflate the ego uh, because it is about surrendering and it's about giving up on our old way of living in every way. It's not only giving up on the on on the, on the, the the drug or the drinking. It's about the thinking, and that is what we are working on. It's about really changing our mindset and patch together a new way of living, which perhaps uh, is is a different path. And and as humans, we sometimes just need, and that's why steps, we just need some basic formula to follow. And that really worked for me. I, I wish I had <laughs> I had those steps in an earlier age and things would have been a little bit easier. <laughs> yeah. Let's uh, tell people a little bit, if they're out there, and I'll say anybody listening, if you're not a CEO, uh, I think that uh, Nick has made it pretty clear that uh, all of us have... Uh, the tendency to fall into these traps, whether we're whatever we're leadership of. And we certainly are all leading ourselves. But if you're a small, if you have a business, 
Like, look at me, I'm one guy with a business, but I lead that, I lead myself, I guess. Or you look at people who have leadership over other people or a family or, you know, or they have a relationship. Everybody out there, I'm trying to lump you all in. And I want to to ask Nick if you can give us some guidelines to say, how do we tell if we're slipping into these dangerous areas? Uh, What are some ways, some warning signs, I guess? Yeah, and that's a great question, and that's a question I was asked also many times uh, when the, my book was out, and and during the, the time I wrote the book, we were in a pandemic. There was lockdowns around the world, and many companies were inviting me to talk about loneliness in the workplace, and I did that during that time. And then everyone asked Nick, "It's it's great that." Uh, you ha- you had a, an, a, an addiction problem, so you got support in a recovery program. But what about us? The most people don't have an alcohol addiction or a drug addiction. So what should we do? And that made me thinking. So I, I, I made my book just like that and created five simple steps, therefore, to follow. So anyone who's listening who might feel, well, I don't have an addiction and so on, but, but I, could, I could actually do with some help. Well, the five steps in my book is basically for anyone to do a touch-up, and I'd be happy to talk them through briefly if you like. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, the first step then is about taking stock. And what we're talking about here is basically if you think of a, a shop owner or a shopkeeper, they would do perhaps an audit of the stock where stock take, either it would be daily, monthly, or at least quarterly or yearly when you look at the inventory and taking an honest look what is missing and so on. But how often do we do that as human beings? How often do we stop, pause, and really, really reflect and writing things down? And that is really what uh, uh, we do in a recovery program. And that's what I encourage everyone to do. You can do it by yourself first, but then discuss through it with a mentor, a sponsor, a coach, or someone or a friend. And in my case, then it was about writing down everything. Well, I had gained, uh, you know, I had gained 60 pounds. I was having an alcohol problem. I had a lot of relationships that were broken. My diet was bad. My blood work was uh, uh, really bad. My blood pressure was high. Cholesterol was high. All these kind of things had to go down. It can be on a piece of paper. It can be in a spreadsheet. So that would be the first step, taking stock. Yeah, that makes sense. Because looking at those things, it, it occurred to me as you're saying it that also that that gets a little bit away from the toxicity of uh, avoidance funny enough with perfectionism we don't look at what's wrong uh, and so looking at things and saying what do i want to impact that's you're kind of confronting the idea of shame then of saying well i got to look at it and if i look at it and and instead of being ashamed of it i can accept that here's some things in my life that i'm going to work on yeah, absolutely. And and once you've written it all down, you know, it's almost like you, you again, you, it's a process, you start to write things down. And by putting it on paper or in a spreadsheet, you're starting to admit to yourself, or it's the first step to admit to yourself that this is an issue. And it's got to be out there. Once you put it down, and then when you, you sleep on that, your subconscious mind will start to already work towards sort of solution mode. And that is then the second step is starting to be ready to asking for help. So once you've written, if you've done this in a spreadsheet, you can on the next row just write, okay, who can you talk to about this? And uh, in, in the case of then a diet, there can be a nutritionist or uh, I needed help with a, a coach and I, he asked me to buy some wearables and things like that. So you know, the second step is really just to make that clear. Think about who can you ask for help. You don't do it right away. First, you, the first step there on step two, asking for help is to write it all down. Uh, and just again, so you're moving forward in these steps. Right. So kind of progressive, these steps are designed to be, they lead into each other. Yeah, absolutely. And then the, the third step then, and this is exactly what I did, was about getting healthy. And and in that instance, it was about starting to you know, change my diet. I stopped the alcohol and, and touch wood. I haven't had a drink since I started this. It's five and a half years ago. Uh, so I managed to change my diet, stop the alcohol. And with that, I lost uh, excessive fat. And uh, and really, it's about not only the, the, the mental health, but also the physical health. Um, I was given medication at this time for depression, and anxiety, and I wanted to taper off them, which I did. And as I increased my exercise and the diet, that took over and it gave me 
uh, what I call in my book, the natural happy pill, which I call exercise. Mm-hmm. A lot. Of, there's been a lot about that uh, research and things about the effects of exercise. And, you know, and, and you had mentioned, and I think this is important too, is people, you know, there's no one magic uh, thing. And I, I'm very pro listening to professionals and getting help from, you know, like, you. but I think there's a difference between going to a doctor to find alternate self-medication to cover up things or going to a doctor and saying, here's what I'm doing. And they might still say, well, you should try this, take this antidepressant for a while or try that. Or, or they might say whatever it is, but it's a whole different mentality. And they've done lots of studies that if you're doing healthy behaviors, that it cuts down on some of the needs oftentimes for, uh, psychotropic medications. Not always. I'm, I'll throw. I always have to throw that out there because I have bipolar disorder, and if I don't take my mood stabilizer, nothing I'm do is gonna uh, is gonna fix the 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 manic depressive cycles without some help there. So I just want to make sure anyone listening out there makes sure to take those seriously. But to back up your point too, that if you are having healthy behaviors and exercise is one that's quite well researched, if you're able to uh, have the right kinds of exercise that there's emotional benefits that sometimes they they uh, counter effect or compensate for some things that we might we might think are only addressable through through medications and such. So that's my little little well I guess I got to qualify that well-rounded message for everybody but but I think it's absolutely in the the research of exercise and healthy diet and their effects on our emotional psychological health are very very there's no question about them. Yeah, and then uh, when you're eating well and you're exercising well, you're also sleeping well. So you get a good recovery, you get a good rest, and and that's been my journey now the last couple of years. And I I, I want to keep more of that. And once I then started to get well physically and emotionally and mentally, then I was ready for step four, which is nurturing healthy relationships. And I think this can be an important one uh, for uh, all listeners. And if they haven't done this. What we mean here is that you wrote down and you're taking stock the relationships that were damaged, uh, uh, the people you had hurt, the people you had harmed, and it can be people, uh, something you said to someone a long, long time ago, uh, and then it's about cleaning this up. And this is easiest done with a sponsor, a mentor, or a coach, or someone to help you. And it's an important step because... We're walking around with so much pain inside us for people we have hurt and we haven't made things right. And I can just share one example here because one of the people on that list was my sister. And there was an episode a couple of years earlier when um, she gave a a Coca-Cola to my son who was five years of age and he had never had a a, a soda before. And that was the first time. And I didn't see when it happened. And I became quite angry because uh, that was not what I wanted. And uh, when I stormed off the table, I grabbed him. And after that episode, we didn't speak. She tried to call me. She tried to send messages. I ignored it, blocked her. And that was really breaking down our relationship. And when I went back here then on working on myself, I had to make amends and apologize for that episode. And that was many years earlier, that episode. So we sort of had met again and we were sort of having neutral relationship but I had not dealt with it properly. It was only because we met at family reunions. Yeah, we started to talk again, you know, and we swipe. it was like it was swept under the carpet, but it wasn't dealt with. And so when I made amends for that, then I, I stood up for it and I said, it was very mature of me. Uh, I should have just clearly told you that he, he doesn't drink soda, but I made such a fuss of it. And I'm sorry, I was not in a good state at the time. And I've been working on myself and I'm trying to build a new path for myself now. And then I said, is there something I can do to make things right and you know she just gave me a hug and of course she forgave me and that was the experience i had with the most incidents and i had i was taught at this time to go back and look even from my high school photos think back on my football team think back about my whole life and write down these kind of incidents it might be that you said something to your neighbor 20 years ago but you are still walking around <clears throat> excuse me you are still walking around with that pain inside. So it's about for your sake to clean up and neutralize all these incidents. And it goes against that controlling perfectionism too, because we can't, we can't be that controlling and have those expectations for ourselves without it bleeding into controlling others as you're describing too, and lashing out when we're lashing in at the same time. So, but by making amends, we're acknowledging it. It sounds like that's, we're admitting, Oh, I admit I can't be perfect. I've already done these things and I need to address them. And I owe, owe that to 
I like how you say that, not just to the people I've wronged, but to myself too, if I'm trying to be healthy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and once we, we then done these amends and we set things right, we will walk around a lot for you. We will so, uh, sleep better at night. And what I do now and what I encourage everyone is to do this on a daily basis. So while uh, in here for the first time, you clear all your past. And then now you do this every night. <clears throat> every night before you go to bed, it's about thinking back over the day. Did I send an email? Did I send an SMS? Did I send a message? Or did I say something to a family member, a colleague that wasn't quite right? Then before you go to bed, you have a chance to perhaps call up that person or send a message and say, sorry, uh, that didn't come out right. I was multitasking and was not what I meant. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, do you have time for a coffee tomorrow? So you do that and then you can go to bed knowing that you have set that day right. Uh, you will go into a good sleep. And once you've done this, then you're ready for the fifth step, which is finding your purpose. I know there's so much talk about purpose now, but unless you have done these steps before, it will actually be blocked. I've been trying to coach uh, executives recently who haven't done the work on themselves. And when you're trying to help them to identify the purpose, there's blockers there. They cannot go inside themselves. They cannot find it. They don't remember the joys from the childhood and the things because it's more pain there. So that's my experience uh, here, right? And the listeners that you've got to sort yourself out before you can then begin to the, the most important step, perhaps, to go inside yourself and find your purpose. And that's, uh, unfortunately, as you put it, people try to embrace that as their first step in self-improvement sometimes. What's my passion? Yes. And we're not ready to. That's a great point. That's, I hadn't thought about it quite that way before, but that's a very progressive to get to a point because how do I find my purpose if I don't know who I am or I'm not being healthy? It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and exactly. If there's so much pain there, there's so much noise in the way. But once you clear that up and for every amend you make and you're setting things right, then you're repairing your relationships. And when you sleep at night, your subconscious mind, it's all positive. All your relationship is great. You have no... No, no harm is there. And it's about cleaning your side of the street only. That's what you can do. But at least you can walk around. You can face everyone. You're not hiding. You're not running away from something. And that's when I found that, you know, that's when the purpose came to me. And, and it's very much for me now, you know, to give back to others. What I found here, uh, I feel that I see so many people in the society today uh, who are in pain, who are completely lost. And, and my, my job now is to be a, a human being to, to show and share what I learned. And that's what I shared with you today, right? And we're listeners as well, a, a small, a small summary of it here today, at least. Yeah. I'm really grateful for it. And it makes a lot of sense how, uh, and w one of the things that I find fascinating is that your purpose and many of the things that you do mm -hmm with your purpose now. You're still an athlete. You're still working in corporate things. You're still engaged in leadership. But your purpose makes the... the the act, Some of the actions might be the same as part of your jobs before, but your purpose is entirely different. Your focus is different, which makes your work different then. That's that's very interesting. Yes. And, and, and I mean, day, daily now, we have over 900 members in our confidential peer groups that then are facilitated by experienced facilitators. And the purpose of these meetings are for either the executives or the entrepreneurs in, in their groups to discuss the work-related challenges they have and to get help to solve them. So the purpose is that the, that means that they are in a group where they sign a non-disclosure agreement. There's no competitor there, no one else from your company. So you have a chance to discuss the things that is pressing. You can then you then learn to be vulnerable. You practice your vulnerability muscle. You're training your vulnerability muscle, and you're learning. Then, well, I share this, and people help me. You're leaving that meeting having a good feeling, and you have more trust around you. Then, so so that's what I do on a day to day basis now, and it, it's really really wonderful to see. And in that sense, I'm living a purpose because I see people are getting it. They understand that this is the way we should do it. Hmm. And giving back leads to uh, one of the big questions I ask everybody when they come on. And we're at that uh, near the end of the program where I ask people what they would suggest to the listeners out there is a, a good way, whether it's an organization, a nonprofit, you've touched on some things already, uh, or a way to give back to the community. How, what is something that's near and dear to your heart as you're sharing? Yeah, so one way I'm giving back is to be there for the 12-step programs uh, that helped me uh, when I was uh, having a crisis. Uh, 
I could say, well, I'm fine now. I don't have to go there, but it's, that's not how it works. I need to be there for the newcomers. I need to share my story and give them experience, share my experience, strength and hope. And, and uh, as I said before, it's about giving back the gift to keep it. So that's one way. Uh, but I'm also a volunteer and fundraiser for a suicide prevention agency and basically trying to break the stigma uh, so that we shouldn't be too scared to discuss suicide because if we close down that conversation completely, that means that our surroundings will not be comfortable to talk about it if it's on their mind. It's better to have someone, and I had plenty of people in the last years who come to me who said that everything from that they are suicidal to that they rehearsed their suicide and then we just say, okay, let's talk about it. And these people are with us today. Yeah. And, uh, and and that, again, links back to my purpose. That keeps me going. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It's it's good things and very helpful things. I hope that everybody out there will take that and apply that uh, to themselves uh, as well. Tell, tell everyone how they find you and what are good ways for them to engage, good ways to find uh, your book and to get involved with what you're doing. Absolutely. Thanks, Dwight. And thanks to all the listeners as well. So indeed, you can look me up on my website. It's nickjohnson.com. And it's the Swedish spelling there, N-I-C-K-J-O-N-S-S-O-N. Or they can go to Amazon and look up my book. It's called Executive Loneliness. It's there as a Kindle, and it's also there as a hardcover. And it's there as an audio book. So if someone want to buy it on Audible, then they can listen to it perhaps during the morning walk or the gym. Great, great. Well, everybody do all that uh, out there, all of it, right now. No, <laughs> I'm going to tell you how to live, but you know, the show's ending. You have plenty of time to go and investigate those things with Nick's uh, stuff, uh, stuff as well. Grateful so much for everybody participating. If anyone out there would like to get involved in the show, uh, there are ways to support. They're not all money-based. You can support the show with money if you want to, uh, but there's other, other things as well where you can participate in either the show, the Broken Brain Podcast, or... Uh, there are ways to get involved with giving back through uh, some of the things I do with my my practice as well, and some of them just have to do with sharing. There's lots of links uh, uh, as well. You can go to dwighthurst.com slash support, and that will also lead to some of the writings. I have to, I have to edit it. I have a few authors who've been on the show, and Nick, I'll throw you up on there too. I like to, to list people who've been on the show so you can follow some of their work as well. So lots of things that are, are free there as, as well as some of the bonuses for patrons of our Patreon. So uh, Nick, thank Thank you so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.